What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Facade. I am your host, Gavin Gallagher, and on this podcast, I explore the mental and emotional game often playing out unconsciously in your mind and in the mind of everyone else in the real estate or property investment market, or any market for that matter. The key to success in this game is to master your mindset and behavior to get a control of your thought process, your emotions, and most importantly, your ego. In last week's episode, I did a Q&A, a live Q&A, and I'm doing it again here on Facebook in the new Facebook group. So here we are, episode seven. And this week I'm talking about resilience in real estate. And um, it's a topic that I know quite a lot about because I have been put to the test over the years. And um, my roller sto- my real estate career is something of a roller coaster ride. So um, let us get into it. First of all, I want to, before I get into it, I want to talk about the Facebook page. And we have. 161 likes now in there so it's growing nicely Uh, but even better than that is the Facebook group which I started last week which I'm streaming live to at the moment but um, last week when I recorded episode 6 we had only 13 members and at this point in time I have got uh, 55 members and uh, quite a few of them joined in the last 24 hours. It's great. And actually, one of the things I wanted to point out about the group is that we have got some um, really knowledgeable people joining up in the group. We have guys that are uh, online entrepreneurs that are, um, you know, with with sizable audiences in uh, either on YouTube or in Instagram. One of the one of the guys in the group has over 18,000 followers on Instagram. Another person in the group has got a business in in Dubai and he's doing extremely well outsourcing and all this stuff. A lot of these guys actually can bring in an interview in subsequent uh, episodes to kind of get their mindset and how they kind of uh, perform. And also, we have a new member, uh, Ed Burke, who is a prop tech entrepreneur, and he is a guy that has started a business called Rumingo. And Rumingo, I'm going to be speaking to Ed tomorrow, and uh, we're going to be discussing a couple of things. Um, but real estate investment, uh, innovation, and impact, those are the three areas that I kind of focus on in my content in general. And those are the three areas I intend to follow. And um, obviously, the last couple of episodes with COVID-19, I've been talking a lot about investment and the mindset around investment and everything. But I will be in the next um, episode, I'll be going, or not the next episode, but in subsequent episodes, I'll be going into the innovation side of things. And I've got quite a lot of guest interviews lined up. Guys, real experts, uh, global experts in areas such as technology, sensors, IoT, blockchain, um, you name it, these guys know it. There's also crypto, a whole side to it um, around crypto and um, the tokenization of real estate. So I think it's an interesting area and I do think that it's something that you guys can all learn from. So um, the idea of this Facebook group, by the way, is just to build this you know, community of like-minded people, but people from different walks of life, different skill sets. And the idea is that collectively we join together and we're a stronger group for it. And I'm only just basically the guy that's pulling the people together. Um, I'm expecting that conversations will start up in the group without necessarily me instigating them. And already we've had a couple of questions from people like Darren and, uh, and stuff like that. So anyone who's listening to this podcast who would like to participate in the Facebook group, please, by all means, have a look. I'll go and leave in the show notes. um, I'll be putting a link to the Facebook group. And um, so by all means, sign up to that. And I'll also be putting a link to my website, my personal website, where I write blog posts and stuff. And I'm going to be starting a newsletter in the near future. And so I'm collecting emails. So anybody who is interested in being on that newsletter, please go into my website, gavinjgallagher.com. And when you're there, if you click on the, if you just scroll down a little bit on the right-hand margin, there is a a join my tribe box where you just enter in your email and you'll become part of it. And then you'll start getting these kind of things on a regular basis. Uh, Once again, I just wanted to point out that this group is talking about the global universal truths and um, the skills and the values that you need to have for this business. This is not a local 
this is not a local issues podcast. So I've been looking at different podcasts that are out there and, you know, there are people recording podcasts that are talking about local issues like planning and all that uh, for the Dublin area. And although I'm coming from Dublin, this is very much a global sort of audience. We've got people listening in from America. Um, I, I actually have three mentees that are working on my mentor program that I've started and one of them is in California one of them is in uh, Ohio and the other one is actually now in Florida so that that's a good mix across the US I've also got some young guys uh, here in Dublin that are actually asking if I could give them some pointers and the same is coming from the UK and stuff so I do expect this will grow and the idea is that it's a global audience that's focused on mindset and the kind of universal stuff not local issues but the stuff that anybody anywhere in the world could apply to their to growing their portfolio and their wealth through real estate so uh, yes coming from dublin what a crappy day it is here you would not believe the weather it's it's been terrible but it has been a crazy day i gotta tell you something that happened last night i po i posted a some of my talking points that i give on these uh, podcasts and I, I do little kind of snippets and I decided to test it out on TikTok and I don't know if everybody a lot of the younger audience will all know what TikTok is but if you're an older generation person you may be wondering what is TikTok or what's the relevance of TikTok why would I be on it but it is unbelievable the response that I've had as of this moment I have about 40,000 views on that post I, sp I did yesterday evening so not even 24 hours and already 40,000 people have seen it and I've had about a thousand new followers today and those followers have translated into LinkedIn uh, contacts have, have followed into new followers on the Facebook group new followers on my Instagram and it's just been an explosion of um, of activity today. I even had a guy uh, write to me offering me to come in on a deal with him. Now, I haven't I haven't had a chance to, to to get up and breathe yet, let alone start looking into deals and stuff like that. But um, it just shows you the power of new media and something I would say to you all is just keep an open mind. I would have poo-pooed TikTok as a kind of something that my kids play with and add music to and all of this. This is you know, unbelievable, just the response. And so many people now, it's a mixed bag. There are people writing very, very funny comments. In fact, I'm thinking about doing a blog post on some of the most insulting comments because it, they're so hilarious. One guy actually told me that if I, if I was a piece of chocolate, I'd eat myself. That was his way of just saying that I've got a big head making these, these uh, posts on TikTok. But I found it very funny. And so uh, I'm actually thinking of doing something humorous on that. So guys, let's get into today's show, shall we? The, um, I wanted to mention that that mentoring program I mentioned already, the, uh, the three guys in America that are signed up, um, you guys, anyone who's interested, you know, reach out to me through social media and just let me know. In fact, go into the group, join the group first. That's the best por port of call to start. If you want to be you know, mentored by me or anything like that, start with joining the Facebook group. When you're in there, you're going to learn a lot from the daily live videos I'm doing from this, you know, very podcast I'm making at the moment and the live stream of it. And then I will do the occasional face-to-face -face Zoom meeting with you to discuss specifics and if it's any kind of a delicate or situation you don't want to be talking about out loud. But generally, I would recommend that you post any questions or topics you want me to cover in the group and that way everybody learns from it rather than it being an individual one-to-one -one because there's just going to be too much there's not enough time in the day for me to get back to everybody and give them the amount of time that they might want personally and so it's probably best share it out and there might be questions that somebody asks that i can actually apply and somebody else will will get the same answer from from a question that they also had and lastly, before I get into the meat of the episode, I thought I'd mention that um, every video that I post now is going and getting uploaded to my YouTube channel. My YouTube channel is called PropTech TV, all one word, PropTech TV. And um, in that, I put everything to do with property and technology all together on my YouTube page. And so if you guys, I would think... 
Um, anybody who is interested in any of my content at all, the probably the best place to actually sign up for it, um, for, for an evergreen kind of content is going to be YouTube. So go there, sign up, hit subscribe, and then get ready for the, the, for the videos because literally everything I record goes there. And, uh, and while you're there, yes, yeah, sub subscribe. And there's going to be a lot more content coming, which I don't want you to miss. Without further ado, let's get into resilience in real estate. So why do I think resilience in real estate is so important? Well, one of the reasons I thought that it's important to kind of go into this is having gone through the hell that I did a couple of years ago. Um, in 2008, I went into 2008. If you haven't he already heard my story, um, go to my website and go to um, media. It's on the top, um, one of the selection boxes at the top. And I've got a whole thing of podcasts that I've appeared on and episodes that I've appeared on. And if you go into that, you'll hear some of the stories, some of the some of the horror stories that I've gone through. And um, that all helps you develop serious resilience. You start to realize that this is a long term game and you cannot have a short term outcome in mind because you're going to get caught. And so uh, I wanted to kind of go into start out with the, in this episode by saying that typical typically investment strategy in real estate is for the long term. Now, I know there's an awful lot of people that will look at flipping and uh, flipping is super popular. You can kind of buy something or put a deposit down and then flip it before you've actually taken control of it. And there's a lot of that going on here in Ireland, a lot of it going in the UK. I see it in America all the time. I see there's these YouTube channels where you can actually watch about guys who buy in bulk and sell and all this. And, you know, there's no, no harm in giving that a shot. But one of the things that I've learned over the time, over the years is that the market can catch you out. And I, uh, one of my own uh, relatives was doing this flipping back in 2007. And I can remember him asking me this question, which was really unusual for a guy that is intelligent and, you know, smart. And he asked me, he said, Gavin, you know, we we've put down a deposit on this property and now I think the market's a bit shaky. I'd like to get out. Do you think the developer will give me back my deposit? And I can remember being dumbfounded at this question because I was saying not only are you not going to get your deposit back, but the guy is going to probably pursue you legally for specific performance. So it's you don't not only do you not get your deposit back, you don't get to walk away from the contract that you signed. You must proceed and purchase the property. And so this was, you know, news to this guy, but that is one of the risks of flipping that you really need to be careful of. When you're signing these things, you just need to be very careful what you're signing up to. Are you now obligated to close the deal? Because it's fine and well to flip a contract if you can find somebody who will take it from you and give you a profit. But if you're unable to do that, you might actually have to proceed with the purchase. And that happened back in 2008 a lot. And I remember people just, you know, not only did they lose the deposit that they had, you know, they had five or six properties in the same development that they were hoping to um, all flip. And there was guys, you know, I remember a, a sales call coming in and there was a lady and she was, we were calling her about this um, property that she had, was flipping. And she she called, we said, you know, you're going to have to close this deal in the next week. And she asked, which one is that? Uh, apparently she had four or five deposits down on four or five properties in this very development. And she didn't even know which one we were talking about closing. So you can be very careless. I have no doubt that that woman probably lost her shirt in the 2008 crash. So beware of flipping. Typically, now let's get into the typical investment strategy. It is much more long term. And by that, I mean is you're typically you buy a property and you hope to get some capital appreciation over time. And capital appreciation usually takes place because of yield compression or rental growth. And you don't get that overnight. Um, it's very rare that your property is going to increase in value so suddenly that you get to profit straight away. Now, I've done it once or twice, but it was, I would say, a fluke. It wasn't something that is sustainable and that's going to happen on a regular basis. And again, you can get badly caught out. So just bear that in mind. Yield compression happens for all sorts of reasons. And um, I remember back when the Irish pound was being replaced by the euro and it was kind of everybody knew 
that there was going to be we were the interest rate in Ireland when we were in under the Irish pound was eight percent and the eurozone was at something like two percent. And so everyone knew that the Irish interest rates were going to go from eight percent to two percent. That was guaranteed yield compression. It was just it was absolutely guaranteed. There was no chance of it not compressing. And and so everyone was buying property. And sure enough, the prices all like hugely rose and everyone was became very, very wealthy in that short space of time. But that was a very unusual economic reason for that to happen. It's not something that comes around on a regular basis. And because you typically use a bank loan to finance the purchase of property, you need the rental income to feed your mortgage payments. And so you're not going to be taking the, the, the income out you're going to be needing that to pay your mortgage, unless, of course, you've got a very good um, mix of interest and payments and uh, and rental income coming in. Because you can obviously have a small wedge where your cash flow is good, but generally speaking, the real value comes from the capital appreciation on the property between the, the purchase and the sale, and that's where you make your money. Only on the rare occasion will you get the flip that actually it happens overnight, and usually it requires an active. Um, investment philosophy. So you're not going to be a person who is a passive investor and does a, a flip. You're going to be somebody who buys a property, then maybe replace the kitchen, refurbish the house, decorate it, and uh, and you know change a few bits and pieces, and then put it back on the market within six months. That's you know you've added value. I wouldn't even call that a flip. That is just adding value to a property, and you can look for a nice uplift on that, especially if you've bought it well and you can buy property well when it is low priced. If you are a passive investor, on the other hand, generally speaking, you buy, you collect rent and you hold long term, hoping that the value of the property will grow. Rent increases will you know, push up the value. But even if there was no rental increase, yield compression can push up the value. And for any of you guys who are new to this this entire business and don't know what I'm talking about when I say yield compression and when I say all of these kind of things. I'll give you an example. If you have a hundred pounds in the bank and you're getting a 10% interest rate, you're going to get 10 pounds per year interest. Well, that would be in, in real estate terms, that would be equivalent to a 10% yield. So it's pretty simple in those terms. But yield is impacted by all sorts of other factors, not just the interest rate. You've got the, you know, the level that it's set at is variable. If you're in the centre of London, you're, you've got properties there that are selling at like 1% yield. And that's because there's such prime locations that there is a huge amount of people who would buy that property, even at just 1%, because the capital appreciation is quite high. If you're buying in, say, a rural part of Ireland or, or anywhere for that matter, the interest, the, the yield is, is going to be more like 10 percent. And that means that the, the higher, the, the better the location of your property, generally speaking, what that means is that your property value and um, the better location means the longer it'll take you to pay off that property. So. But it's like a piece of gold, basically. If you've got a property in the center, uh, you know, the, in the in the central bu business district in New York City or London or you know Paris or something like that, it's absolutely gold dust. And there are people buying property at a one percent yield because it's like buying a piece of gold. And you can buy the property, and it'll take a hundred years of income for that property to pay itself off. But it's like buying a yield and a treasury bond or something like that they tend not to fall in value. There'll be very few risks with a property like that. If you buy something that I, I see people sometimes write to me saying, Gavin, I'm, I'm looking slightly out of town or I'm looking in the countryside because the prices are much better. The prices are better, but that does not mean that you're going to enjoy the same kind of level of uplift in value, yield compression, all of these things. So you might buy at a low value, but it's probably going to grow at a low at a lower amount as well. So you need to be aware of all these things. Also, the sector that you're in is also going to affect the yield. So uh, at the moment, I industrial property, the yields are typically around 8 to 10 percent, maybe even lower than that now that it's, it's so popular. Retail, on the other hand, even the, you know when Amazon came along and started destroying retail, retail became kind of less popular. But 10 years ago, you could buy retail at one and three, one to three percent yield in the in the prime locations in in Dublin. London's the same, 
So retail was hot and it was primarily because if you're in a busy location like a street where um, huge amounts of volumes of shoppers go, that's a very, very rare location. Then we get into the size of the property, the quality of your tenant, the age of the building. All of that will impact your yield because the larger the property, usually there's some sort of drop in the yield because of the size. So as you get bigger and bigger and bigger, there's less populate, there's less people out there who can afford a property of this size. And so usually it changes it slightly. And then, and then at the end of the day, interest rates. So falling interest rates usually reduces the yield on a property as well. So yield essentially is the interest rate that you're getting from your so you buy something for a hundred thousand if you're getting ten thousand a year in rent your yield is your cap rate is another word for it your yield or your cap rate is ten percent if your property is paying you only five thousand and you paid a hundred thousand for it you paid five percent you got a five percent yield it means that you're getting five percent from the value that you put down on in the property if it's in a good location and if all of this these factors that i mentioned before if they are favorable, then you will see yield compression. And what that means is that your 5% will be compressed to 4% or to 3%. And if you're, say, on a 10% yield, you might see that that compresses to 9 8 or 7%. And when that happens, you, you get value increase. I'm not sure whether I've confused everyone with that or not, but I'm actually planning on doing a workshop. So if anyone wants to join in the workshop, please sign up to the newsletter on my website, right-hand column, and uh, put your email in there. And I'm going to be sending out this uh, link to do some sort of a Zoom call where I'm going to do like a webinar. And the webinar will be a workshop on all of the kind of valuation techniques and how to do this kind of thing. So we've established that real estate investing is a long-term thing. Now we've got to get into the cyclical nature of it. And that is where resilience comes in, because um, generally speaking, now it, the cycles are about every seven years, you're going to see property grow, um, grow for a couple of years, and then it hits its peak, and then it falls for a couple of years, and it hits its trough. And generally speaking, it's around seven years between the, the peak and the trough, but that can vary. It's sometimes it'll be five years, sometimes it'll be 10 or 12 years. So you're never exactly sure, but you've just got to be aware that there are peaks and there are troughs. And at sooner or later, you're going to witness a trough and sooner or later, you're going to wish an, witness a peak. And what we often call is, we call it the market clock. And by that, what I mean is that if you take, say a clock face, okay, when the clock face, uh, when, the, when, the, when the hand, when the hour hand is way up at midnight, that is when you're at the absolute top of the market. Can't go any higher, that is the top of the market. And then as it goes on to three o'clock, what that is, is now you're in a falling market. And so three o'clock is a bad thing. You want to get out before you get to midnight and you do not want to get to be owning something or trying to sell it when you're going from zero to three because it's a falling market. Um, then when at six o'clock is the lowest point in the market, that is where you're at the very bottom. Now that is the time to buy. If you can, nobody ever knows when is the bottom of the market, but if you're watching the market and if you're looking at the different blogs and the different informations that are being sent out by say brokers and real estate agents and market professionals, you'll see them commenting on what part of the market clock you're in. So you want to sell before you get to midnight because at midnight, usually the party is over and it's starting to fall already. Last November, by the way, was the midnight point in this market. It was, everything was raging, flying, perfect. And then along comes COVID-19 and suddenly the market now, you, I would say we're heading into this kind of one, two, three o'clock kind of time scale. And you're going to find that the market will continue to fall for another while. I don't think it's going to stop falling for some time to come. When it gets to six, that's when you want to be buying again. And buy, you might buy at five o'clock and it might drop a little bit more, but then you're going to ride seven, eight, nine, ten, all the way. You've got you've got the full cycle to enjoy the up ride. And when you get that, if you get that right, you can make so much money in the real estate game. The problem is that you get caught, and then uh, the the opposite of that happens, and you end up 
with a bank loan that is much greater than the amount of cash you have to service it or whatever. So this is why it's a risky business. You do have to be careful. And resilience is so essential because you're just you're guaranteed to get caught out. Do not think that you're the smart guy that will outsmart the market, that will see everything coming before anyone else. Now, you're going to have some wins and you're going to have some fails. Once you accept that, you'll start to be a little bit more cautious about the way you do your deals. You're not going to be a person that says, right, I'm putting everything on this one deal because that could be the one deal that goes down. What you want to do is spread your risk a little bit. That's where I've advised people before to try to find a group of people to get together rather than putting all your money on one deal unless you're absolutely convinced you're buying at say six o'clock in the market clock, then you're at the bottom of the market, then you're good. But once the the clock has started to rise and you're getting near the top, that's when you don't want to be taking any more. You shouldn't be buying really at the top of the market, obviously, because you're just going to fall unless it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to secure, say, a really great piece of land or something like that. And you don't mind that it's going to fall in value because it's part of some wider strategy. You've got to be a contrarian in this business. And by that, I mean, and it's, it's where Warren Buffett has said it before, you're going to be the guy who buys when everyone else is selling so you're greedy when everyone is fearful and then when you're watching everyone out buying new cars and new watches and going on holiday that's when you should be selling your property because the market has gotten hot everyone is doing equity releases and paying themselves and that is why i talk a lot about the three e's the ego the emotion and the economy those are the three e's that will sink your career sink your um your portfolio because you'll just get caught by one of those. So always bear that in mind. Let's ex let's just assume that you've accept your situation and you're no longer, you know, you accept your situation. Resilience means that the market is now falling. You accept the situation. You don't have this fear any longer or panic setting in. You just, you know that this is part of the cycle, that you're going to ride the cycle down. You're not panicked because you didn't take stupid bets. You were, you know, you, you, you ex exercised restraint throughout your buying cycle and you didn't overpay. You did everything right. Now you can ride out the downturn and you're, you're in good shape. Now, what you've got to be careful about on the downturn is not to get lazy by thinking, OK, I can't do anything. You should still be looking at deals because there will be people that are in, say, a distressed situation and they have to get out and they'll accept anything to get out. And uh, there are situations that I've seen like that, but they're rare enough. But the reality is, is when you're at the bottom of the market, that is when most of the money that you'll ever make is going to be made. And so you should really be careful. So resilience comes, you're ready and you're prepared. You know you got a long slog. Don't overextend yourself because then you're in a position where you can't buy the bargains when they come along and whatever you do this is something that you really need to be careful about don't try not to at least get into a situation where you're doing an equity release to fund a lifestyle i've said before that this is a business and it's got to be treated like a business not a lifestyle a lot of mistakes are made by people who they see their property increase in value and they say, wow, I can go to the bank now and I can take out 50,000 and or I can take out my original deposit. I have no problem you taking out your original deposit if you're going to put it into another investment or if you're going to put it into a bank account and just sit on it. But do not take out that money and put it into, you know, a new car or a holiday or, you know, anything that is lifestyle orientated. The reason is, is that this game is long term and cyclical, as I've mentioned. And that kind of thing comes back to haunt you. And what you just do not want to get into the habit of or into the trap of, uh, I call premature gratification. And by that, I mean, this game is set up to reward the people who delay their gratification. If you're, you know, if you're living a modest lifestyle, stay in that modest lifestyle as long as you can. I mean, you know, everyone has different circumstances perhaps you know your family doesn't allow that or whatever but if you you know the longer the more successful you will be, be by delaying gratification and i've seen guys taking money out so they can buy a fancy watch or something like that i've done these things by the way i i went and bought cars and all sorts of stuff and then 
the, the bad turn times come along and you're on the, the downward cycle when the market is and you've got this stupid watch or the stupid car that is now worth a fraction of what you paid for it. And that money could have been easily used to pay for a deposit on a new property or a loan or anything like that. So this is one of the things that I, I just, you know, delay your gratification and try to live in with restraint. And that's one of the oars in my my six oars that I talk about in this business. Restraint. This business rewards patience. And that is one thing that you've got to remember. So during the downturn, you've got to be strong mentally. And this is when you're also going to have to be super busy and active. All of the best deals are done when the times are tough. And a good friend, a friend of mine, actually, in 2000 and, uh, from 2009 to 2014, that was the worst t- point in the uh, downturn. He made a fortune by just being super busy. He was all the time working. I remember thinking the guy was workaholic, but he was busy, 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 constantly looking at deals, constantly checking out stuff. And um, and he just ended up amassing this fortune because he was in the right place at the right time. He was looking at uh, maybe 100 deals. And of the 100 deals that he did, he would only progress maybe five or six of them to the point where he might actually put a, uh, m- you know, go for one or two and secure one or two. So that is not unusual. 100 deals you look at, the 100 deals you look at, five or six will tick the box and you'll be saying, hmm, this is interesting. This is worth possibly buying. And then you go into a competitive um, situation where you've got to make a bid or you've got to kind of put your best foot forward and put an offer on the table. You're not always going to get it. Those five offers that you're going to make, you'll be lucky if you get one or two of them. And that is the reality. So the busier you are, the more deal flow you'll be looking at and the more likelihood that you're going to get some good properties into your portfolio. And that you, you have competition. You know, you're not the only guy out there who is sitting on cash and ready to go and invest. You're going to be up against other people. So just have your uh, investment criteria clear in your head, clear exactly what you want, and then start going after it. Now, to get into the investment criteria, as I mentioned, I'm going to do this workshop. But some of the things that I thought I would mention, part of being resilient is understanding the risks early on and knowing what you're facing. And if you're going to be a passive investor, then these are some of the things you need to worry about, okay? You've got to worry about market risk. And market risk is what we're currently experiencing now. Downturn, economic um, problems. The COVID-19 came out of nowhere. Nobody saw this market risk coming. But you should always be aware that market risk is a possible risk. And therefore, don't discount that. Next is financial risk. And this is something that is slightly related but the reality is is that before you actually um when you buy something you're buying it at a at an interest rate and the interest rate that you you've got from your bank is going to be a certain level and you need to think about the next couple of years is that level going to stay at the same or is it going to increase or is it going to decrease now i got i didn't quite get caught but i very nearly got caught i bought a property i took quite a large loan on it i think i I think I borrowed 5.7 million euro. And I can remember the property was bringing in a certain amount of rental income that pretty much matched the interest rate on this. So it was very, very close. And I was happy with that. And that is one of the reasons why your yield or your cap rate is linked to interest rates because everybody can do this. And so they tend to kind of stay around the same level. And I, so I put the money down and I got this property. And then as I was watching the market go, suddenly interest rates started to increase. And it got to the point where initially I was getting a little bit of free cash flow because the rent I was getting was greater than the interest I was paying. And so I had this little bit of surplus extra. That changed then and suddenly it was getting less and I was getting less and I was getting less. And it got to the point where I can remember worrying that in the next three to six months, I might actually have to start putting uh, this money into paying that interest rate. And so that is your financial risk. You've got to be really careful with that. And your banking terms, maybe you fix the interest. If you think you've got a good deal, fix it. If you think that the market could increase, definitely fix it. But in this current market now that we're in, I actually think probably interest rates are going to fall further because they're going to be all sorts of stimulus packages to try to get the economy going again. So probably, if anything, they're going to drop interest rates. And what that's going to do is going to increase the values of 
properties in the long term. But we've got all of these other risks to worry about. So financial risk. Next, you've got vacancy risk. And you can all pretty much guess what that is. You buy a property, you buy it empty because the tenant is gone or whatever. And you think, okay, I'll rent this place in two months. That can actually be very, very bad assumption to make. You can find that guys play hardball, don't want to move in, or they've gone somewhere better or whatever it is. So your vacancy risk is a very real thing. And I would strongly recommend you don't buy a property that is sitting empty unless you've got some good reserves to actually be able to keep it going. Um, I bought property in the past and I can remember, uh, you know, some good deals, you found a tenant very quickly, um, but some bad deals. I had a property for about seven years and in that time I could not find a tenant because the initial tenant that I thought I was going to get, um, they pulled out of the deal. And so once they pulled out of the deal, I could not find a single person to go in for about seven years. I had to carry it. I had to carry the interest rate. And I ended up selling that property for one fifth of what I paid for it. So it's not all up, up, up. Now, I did, you know, over the years, make plenty of money on other deals. But this is what I mean by the wins and the fall on the fails. Like this is not a business where you get only success. You can have failure as well. So you've got to kind of balance the way you 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 way you work it and the way you take risks. The next is tenant risk. So you buy a property and you have a tenant in that property. You've got to assess your tenant. Are they strong or are they weak? You might have a guy that is, say, working in a sector that has been affected by COVID. Suddenly, you've got a guy that's now unemployed, can't pay his rent. Equally, and, and I'm you know making this podcast here in East Point, we have got big multinationals, but those guys are not oblivious to this situation with COVID as well. We've been approached by a couple of people and they're looking for rental holidays. They're asking for assistance. They're because they're in, say, the travel sector that's really been badly affected or they're serving, um, you know, they're, they're, they're selling into the food and beverage sector, which is also very badly hit. So their customers have lost money and so they're not buying from them. It's a vicious cycle. So this happens at all ends of the market, right down to your individual tenant all the way up. So just check your tenant, check their references, check their, you know, if you can find out, you know, get us some idea of their their financial history. Um, are they responsible people? Do they pay their rent? You'll often find uh, any kind of details from doing some due diligence on that. And finally, location risk. And the location risk is something that, as I mentioned earlier, you can buy in the wrong location and your property is just not going to be very easily easy to sell. And um, for example, if you have an adjoining neighbor who uh, is in a competing business that is not complimentary, you're going to find it hard. Or if you've got somebody who's doing construction work right next door, that's location risk because nobody's going to want to move into a construction site. Also, for example, roadworks or changes to the city plan. Now, I was involved in a car parking business in the past and we had a very, very strong business that, you know, plenty of cars came in all the time. And then what we found was over the years, the city council decided that they did not like the amount of cars coming into the city and they wanted to make it more pedestrian and bicycle friendly. And so they started reversing the direction of the traffic. They started reducing two lanes and three lanes down to one lane and they'd give priority to public transport. And all of this started to impact our business very dramatically. And we went from a situation where we were typically four or 5,000 cars a week would be coming through the business. Suddenly it went down to two and a half thousand. So that is something about location risk. You just have to be careful that you're aware of future plans. Maybe your property is going, maybe the road is going to be widened. Um, maybe there is going to be a dead end put in at there. You know, you need to look into the city's long-term plans for that area to make sure you're not buying something that is going to be stuck in an area that suddenly becomes less attractive. I mean, if you buy um, a retail unit in the main street just before a big shopping center goes in outside the town, you're probably going to be in a bad location because of that other. So pay attention to location risk. Now, that's all investment property. If you get into development, you've got those same five risks, but you've got these additional three. First of all, you've got planning risk. Now, if you buy a property and you want to develop it, you're, if you, the best value land is always the one that doesn't have zoning or doesn't have planning permission. 
you can get it for cheap, but you run the risk of not getting your permission or not getting it zoned. And then you're stuck. You're stuck with a property that you cannot. Also, you might have adjoining neighbors that object to what you want to do. This is a problem we're going through at the moment. We have a property that we bought and uh, we, we've been told by the local council that we can build, I think, four floors, a four floor uh, apartment building on it. And all of the surrounding properties are sort of dwellings, like single story or two story houses. And they do not want four story buildings looking out over their garden and stuff. So we, we've had a lot of objections and that is planning risk. And the planning risk results in delays and the delays cost you money because you're borrowing money and stuff. You've also got construction risk. Once you get the building going, you're going to get into cost overruns. And that is particularly in the case of people who buy old, out, outdated buildings. If you buy a building that is, you know, pre-1960s or pre-1950s, you're going to find stuff goes wrong with them. You know, the, the pipes all need to be replaced. And, and there's all sorts of reasons why costs can run. If you're building something from scratch, like a brand new building completely, that is something that is going to run into time and you can find that the price that you assumed for such and such a product is actually much more or lifts have gone up or electricity uh, not electricity but the electrical components that you want to put in they've gone up because there's demand from china there's all sorts of little reasons why construction costs can overrun so you just need to be careful of that that's why people hire quantity surveyors and all of this kind of stuff and finally, timing risk, and that's related heavily to the planning and the construction. But delays, what delays do, so if you have a planning delay and then if you have a construction delay, you can find that you've now missed your market and the market has suddenly gone into a downturn while you thought you were going to deliver the property at the midnight uh, timetable. Um this is one of the big risks that you take. Now, it also can work with you. In the past, I have bought property that I bought it at the very lowest point in the market. And because I bought it at the bottom of the market, I had this extra time. If I had bought it at the nine o'clock point in the market, I would have missed the time. But I got the timing right. I bought it at six o'clock. And that gave me time and I applied for planning. The planning was rejected. I applied again. The planning was rejected again. And then the third time was lucky and I got the planning. So we started construction and the construction ran through. And at the end of construction, the market had just gone absolutely bonkers. And the prices of the land and stuff had increased by about five times, five X. So the price we paid for the land, the land was now worth five times what we paid for it because of that delay of planning. So it can work for you, but it can also work against you if you get the timing. So timing's everything. Timing risk is a big one. So just make sure you keep those in mind. Don't assume that this is just a straightforward deal. You've got all of those little issues that can pop up and throw a, a hand grenade into your deal that you think is going to go very, very well. <laughs> So once you understand the risks, you can start to mitigate them. I'm not going to say eliminate them because it's almost impossible to eliminate these risks, but you can mitigate them or you can, what, by that I mean, you can lower the risk. And how do you do that? Well, you know, you can look at all sorts of ways. You can, you know, your construction, you can bring in a project manager. Um, with vacancy risk, you can go and you can sign up a good tenant before you do the deal, or you can make the you can make the deal contingent on you getting a tenant. Or the best deals that I've ever done, I've actually had a tenant already booked to go in before I buy the property. Financial risk, you can fix your rates. Market risk, you just do not know when the market is going to turn, but you can have a good indication from the market clock. If you're at six, then you probably have a couple of years until it hits midnight. And so that is a good thing. But don't ever bet all your eggs. Don't ever put all your eggs in the one basket because you could find that you're, you're caught. And so that's why it's always good to join forces. And then lastly, being resilient just means keeping an open mind and looking at alternatives and being innovative. And one of the reasons I started my YouTube channel called PropTech TV, one of the reasons I started that channel was because I'm fascinated by technology. And PropTech is a combination of property and technology. And it's becoming a major sector there at the moment in this industry. And billions have been invested in companies that 
specialize in prop tech. So this being the case, it is something that I do think you should all look at. And it's something that forms part of my overall interest with my content. So as I said before, it's real estate investment, real estate innovation and real estate impact. And by impact, I'm going to get into that later, but all about doing good for your community and things of that nature. That's impact. And these podcasts, these lives that I'm doing, I'm hoping that I'm having an impact on you guys by sharing some of the mistakes and failures and successes and whatever. Sharing my insights with you guys, I'm hoping will give you guys a good understanding of how to sidestep these issues. And by that, I'm hoping I give you some positive impact. So anyway, I'm not going to go into the whole technology thing because it, it's a whole episode on its own. I will say though that I do have a number of guests lined up for interviews and they are prop tech specialists and they're guys that are, they'll blow your mind. Like some of the technology out there is just incredible. And anybody who is interested in this business in the long term should really be studying the innovation side because I do think that that is going to transform. And if you are currently dealing with COVID-19, you will wish that you had technology like virtual reality tours of your property and online valuations and all of this kind of stuff. You could have been selling property while you were in a the lockdown, whereas some people that had traditional business weren't able to do anything. They had to be present on the site to, to, to view the property, whereas other people had these electronic virtual reality tours and they could continue to kind of service the and get offers in. So COVID-19, yeah, difficult times, but um, we'll come out the other end. And one of the things to remember about resilience is that tough times don't last, tough people do. And that's what you need to remember. You need to keep that in your mind, that you're going to be a tough person. You're going to have this resilience. You're going to understand the market is cyclical. You're not going to be a person who gets all emotional and says, oh, you know, I'm doing fantastic. Everything is rosy. I'm going to go and take an equity release. I'm going to go and give myself a big celebration because that's where you get caught. One example of that is people who are buying property to rent on Airbnb. Suddenly Airbnb is closed. So I've been looking at the market here and a huge amount of properties have come on the market at about 50% the amount that they would normally be getting. And so if you're the person who holds that piece of property, it's pretty tough at the moment. You're getting 50% what you thought. Probably this is costing you money. You probably actually have the bank chasing you. And so you got to be tough. You got to be resilient. But if you stand strong, if you hold out, you will get to the other side. And if you're busy and if you're, if you're creative, you should be able to see plenty of opportunity in the coming months ahead. So that's it, guys. Episode seven is over. You've been listening to Behind the Facade. Thank you very much. If you found it useful, I'd be very grateful if you consider sharing the episode out to your friends or somebody who might be interested in this kind of stuff. If you have any questions or topics you'd like me to cover, please leave a comment in the Facebook page or particularly this group. Again, Behind the Facade Community Facebook group. If you're listening and you're interested in participating in the conversation, join the group and we've got a good crew now joining up. We've got 55 people. I have a few people watching on the live as we speak. And um, while you're there, will you just leave a comment where you are listening in from? Because I'm fascinated to know how these um, how these podcasts are getting out there. Who's listening? Are you what country are you in? I'd love to know how far this is spreading. And I do know that there are a number of people now in the US listening. And I know that there's people in Dubai and the UK listening. So for me, based here in Ireland, it's super interesting to look at the global nature of this business. I'm going to be doing another Q&A soon, so leave your comments, any topic you want to cover, and I'll be going to it. And I'll be doing another live stream so you can actually leave questions in the comments if you so desire. If you want to connect with me, GavinJGallagher.com is the website. Again, on the right-hand column, there is a Join My Tribe. If you put your email in there, you'll be added to the newsletter, which I'm going to start fairly soon. And in that, I'm going to be sharing out all the different stuff that's going on because not everyone can. There's so much content coming through these days in your Facebook feed or in your Instagram that you just don't know what I've posted. So the idea is to just compile that all in one email that goes out maybe once a week and you just get to see there's everything that went out this week. And lastly, have another look at that uh, YouTube channel of mine, PropTech TV. If you go in there, hit subscribe and uh, and just watch some of those videos. Everything that I make is going to be going onto the PropTech TV 
YouTube channel. So Prop Tech TV, all one word. You'll find me in there. I've put a couple of my keynotes. So that's it, guys. Until next week, hope you have a good one and um, talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you.